There we go. Check. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Dave. Well, it is great to be with you today. And yes, always measure your water bottle before you test it out in the Too big. Well, it's great to see you here today. It's great to be in the house of God on this September long weekend, Labor Day. Amen? It's good that we get a day off every once in a while, even though it seems like the last three months, what exactly was that? Six months now, eh? Where Has anybody been counting days? I, I was counting days for a while. I just said, forget it. We're going to find a new way. But before we get started, I want to just share something that God put on my heart months and months ago. He, he actually told me specifically to reach out to, to six different individuals who are all pastors and, and just to start encouraging them and start building them up and, and being there for them in whatever capacity I could be. And so I started that process. This is last kind of November, December kind of thing. And then last week I came across this stat it was a survey that was released uh, to pastors across North America. And the results came in, and what they said is 25% of pastors are le- they're strongly considering to leave the church that they're in during this time. And, and that really hurt, and, and that just kind of disturbed me. I'm like, okay, what, what's going on that we're seeing such a, a number of people who are in leadership positions leaving their church. And we, we know the results. We can't blame it all on COVID, but we know that that's a major factor. But I was very just disturbed to see that over the process of the last few months, of the six people that God told me to raise up in prayer and to encourage and be a part of, every single one of them has left the ministry. And, and that... It, that broke my heart because I'm like, did I not do enough? Did I, did I not spend enough time with them? Did I not encourage them? And God said, no, you were, you were, you were there just to encourage them to get to the where they needed to be. Not to maybe change the outcome, but just so that they knew they weren't alone in this. And, and it, it's, it's been a, a tough pill to swallow. So what I want to encourage everyone here and everybody listening online and watching, uh, please, be in prayer for not only the, the, the pastoral leadership of this church, but every God-fearing church out there, okay? Th- this needs to be on the, the forefront of our, our, our thoughts and our prayers, that we are lifting others up, because I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, and I mentioned this to our leadership team. I really believe this next season we are entering in is going to see the consolidation of many churches, where instead of having like a church kind of on every corner, we're going to see those, those churches consolidate into more of a, a singular unit. And it, it's, it, that excites me because I think it's a part of unity that has to come about, that we're, we start kind of laying down the individualism and start realizing that we are in this together, not only as a church, local church, but as churches across the nation and across the world. So I, w- I want to be, you to be in prayer for these other churches. And just so you know, I have no plans on leaving. I'm going to outlast all of you here. Don't worry. Okay. And that's a scary thing. But yeah, I've, I've seen what happens. But we are at the, the point in time where we have to understand the will of the Father. We've been playing church for far too long. Simply just doing the things in motion. Just doing the things because that's the way we've always done them. And sometimes we've lost the the path of the actual reason for doing it. We need to get back to the basics. I really believe that this COVID season that we're in now is like a giant reset button. Okay? Okay. Like, you know when your computer's not working, what do you do? You turn it off and turn it back on, right? It works 99% of the time. And I think that's kind of what we can see happening during the season is it's kind of like the reset button. You're turning it off, and then we're going to turn it on. And when it comes on, it might not look the same way as it did before. 
I'm actually hoping it doesn't. I'm hoping that we actually get to the place where each and every Christian, each and every believer is doing what God has purposed on their heart. And we will see a transformation, not only in our church, but in our city, in our province, and in our, in our nation. So today I want to continue my series, and I love when this happens. Uh, this used to happen quite a bit, but then it stopped happening for a while, and now it seems like it happens again. Is When I create one message, as I'm preaching it, God tells me that's not just a message, that's a series. I'm like, all right, I can do that. Because everything we covered last week, every one of those, those five points, six points, just, I'm like, I could say so much more on that. There's so much more that God wants to say through that. So that, that's where we're going to be for the next few months, is getting the bride ready for his return. If you weren't here last week, uh, weren't able to watch it, I would encourage you, go online, get that. that that's kind of going to be the synopsis of where we're going for the next few months. We're just going to do it in a lot more detail. But let's get started. Today we're going to talk about five reasons why obedience is key to making the bride ready. There was a father who called his five small children together and they sat on the floor and he, and he took this gift and he put it in between them and he wanted to teach them a lesson. He said, okay kids, whoever is most obedient gets the present. The kids just kind of looked there bewildered and he's like, okay, they must not understand. He goes, okay, kids, whoever listens to mummy the best and does what mummy says the best gets to open the present. The middle child goes over, picks up the gift walks over to the dad and gives it to the dad. Says, Dad, you do what mommy says better than all of us. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. How about the trained dog? There's a, a lady who wanted a dog. And, you know, during COVID, uh, a lot of people have decided they want the pets. And so this lady goes out and she goes to the pet store and she sees there's three dogs there, but they're all at different prices. One's 500, one's 700, and one's 50 bucks. And she goes, well, what's the difference between them? He goes, well, this first dog, if you say bark, it'll bark. If you say jump, it'll jump. And it pretty much listens to what you have to say. And so she says, okay, that's fine. What about the 700? Well, the 700, he can roll over. He can beg. He can sing. He can do all these amazing tricks. And she goes, 700, well, what about this $50 dog? She goes, well, the $50 dog will do anything he hears you say. Anything I hear, he hears, I'll, I'll take that one. So she pays the $50, takes the dog home, sits down, and she says, bark. Dog says nothing. She says, okay, sing. Doesn't sing. She, okay, lay down. The dog just sits there and stares at her. And she, roll over. Just stares. She goes, this dog doesn't work. So she takes the dog, goes back to the store, and says, you lied to me. You told me this dog would do every, anything he heard me say. He said, well, I didn't lie to you. It's just the dog's deaf. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What about this one? There's a young couple who were having their very first fight, and it was a big one. And while the husband said, when we got married, you promised that you'd love honor, and obey. And his bride replied to him, I know, but I didn't want to start an argument right there in front of all those people. There you go. Well, that's your humor for the day. Today is part two of our the series on the bride has made herself ready. The, this entire series is based on this one statement. Jesus is waiting for his bride to get ready so he can return for her. Okay? Jesus is waiting for his bride to get ready so he can return for her. That is the only thing that is restricting God from returning and taking his church back home. It's not because certain things have to be fulfilled or certain prophecies or certain words or certain times. No, it's simply because he is waiting for his bride to get ready. I mentioned this stat a while ago, um, but the biggest estimates is that about 35% of the world is Christian right now. I, I believe that that's a pretty overinflated number. I don't know if that is actually true, but there's a number of different sites that, that's, 
that put this down. But if Jesus was to return, that would mean two-thirds of the world would be destined for hell. That's not my definition of a loving God. But God has put us here to fulfill His purposes. Now, do I believe that every single person is going to get saved on the earth before He returns? No, I don't believe that's true. I believe every person is going to have the opportunity to hear the gospel for themselves and either accept it or reject it. I believe that is true. But today I want to look at kind of the overriding glue that holds all of this together. The most fundamental part of having a relationship with God is this. And it's a word that it's not very, I don't know, people don't really like this word today. They kind of rebel against it and reject it, but really the word is obedience. If if someone comes to you and says, you must obey, what's the first thing that happens? Yeah. <laughs> you want to fight? <laughs> yeah. Obedience kind of goes against our inner nature of who we are. We want to be free to do what we want when we want, and we don't want anyone to tell us otherwise. We don't want to have to obey anyone. But I will tell you this, unless you obey, learn how to obey God in all things, you will never reach the potential of who God called you to be. We're going to expand on this a little bit more. Because we're going to talk today about obedience to Christ. Five reasons why obedience is key to making the bride ready. If you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, you can turn to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 7 Verses 21 to 24 is where we're going to start today. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt. For, for did I not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices? But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. And you will be my people. And you will walk in all the way which I commanded you, that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels, and in their stubbornness of their evil heart, and went backwards and not forward. Why is obedience a key to making the bride ready? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. It is paramount. Let me explain. There's five points, five keys that I want to gather today. Number one, when you are obedient, you can walk with God. If you want to say that in the negative, when you're disobedient, you can't walk with God. But I like looking at it in the positive. So when you are obedient, you can walk with God. Let's, let's talk about one of the more interesting stories that we always teach in Sunday school, but the story of Noah. How many recall the story of Noah? Some. The big flood. He built the big boat. Floods came. Covered the earth. God wiped out everything. And saved one family. And then a bunch of animals. In Genesis 6, verses 68, it says this. The Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out the man whom I have created on the face of the land. From the man to the animals to the creeping things and the birds in the sky. For I am sorry that I made them. But God found favor, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God looked over the whole earth, and he had regret that he made everything. Think about that for a moment. Have you ever made something and then regret making it? Maybe if you, you make a brownie, and instead of putting in sugar, you put in salt. 
Maybe then you'd regret making that. But for the most part, when we do something, we don't have this, this idea that, oh, I regret doing that. I wish I would have never made that. But that was a God was feeling towards all of creation because all of creation had turned their back on him and started doing their own thing. They rejected God and he was, he was sorry he made them. So let's ask the question, how did Noah find favor in God's eyes? Because when God looked over the whole earth, everything disappointed him except for Noah. Well, that tells us in the next verse in Genesis 6, 9. For these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. And Noah walked with God. How would you like that to be your epitaph? You know, written on your tombstone? That would just... <laughs> What's your name in here? Was a righteous man or woman. Blameless in him or her time. Think about that. Because Noah was obedient to God, he was able to walk with God. There is a direct correlation to the closeness of your relationship with God and your obedience to Him. If you are in constant rebellion against the things of God, that will bring separation between you and God. John 14, 15, Jesus says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you are feeling distant from God, if you're feeling that you've been abandoned by Him, the first place I would encourage you to look is, is there some place in your life where you have been disobedient to Him? Is there something in your life that you're holding back? Is there something that you're not doing that He's asked you to do? You see, that disobedience allows for a separation. Not that God pulls back from us, but that we raise up a standard in between Him and us that we no longer feel close to Him. John 9.31 says, For we know that God does not hear sinners. Wow. But if anyone is God-fearing and does His will, He hears Him. You know, somehow we got this idea, oh, God will heal your prayer. God will, you can just keep living in your sin, keep doing whatever you want to do. And then you pray and nothing happens. Wow. Maybe it's because obedience is an important thing. Actually, obedience is key to maintaining a relationship with God. You want a closer relationship with God? Obey what He tells you to do. You want a, a relationship where God, whether you feel His presence? Be obedient. Sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59.2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. Now this is definitely true for the unbeliever. But I want to tell you this is also true for the believer. You say, well, when Jesus forgives me, He forgives me from all my sins from future, past, and present, right? Yes, that's talking about a salvation issue. That's talking about you are now made right with God. But it's still the things we do today which can cause a distance between us and Him if we don't obey. You want some proof of this? Have you ever done something or not done something you know you should have done where God told you to do it and you didn't do it? Was the initial effect that you felt further from God or closer to God? Think about that in your own life. When you've had a fear, because fear doesn't come from God, if you are following a fear, that will actually bring distance between you and God. That's really what you should be afraid of. 
So how do we get back? The number one key is repentance. Right? Repent. What does repentance mean? Repentance is literally a word meaning if you're walking this d- direction, you repent by walking this direction. Okay? It's making a 180 degree turn. We're not just talking about sinning and then confessing your sin, although that's very important. But if we just sin and confess, we get in the sin, confess, sin, confess cycle. You know? If you've ever been caught in a habitual sin or something, you just keep going over and over again and you've confessed it to God, but then you go do it again, you confess it to God, you go do it again, it's because you've never repented. You've sinned, you've confessed it. You've sinned, you've confessed it. You've sinned, you've confessed it. It's just a cycle that goes over and over again. How you break that cycle is through repentance. Of actually changing your action, changing your mindset, changing the things you're doing so you stop going down that road. That's obedience. Number two, when you are obedient, you are much more useful to God. Remember the story of Noah that we started with? Let me just give you, in my mind's eye, what would have happened if Noah wasn't an obedient person. God comes to Noah and says, Noah, build a boat. Noah says, God, I don't want to. I'd rather sit in my hammock and soak up the rays. God says, Noah, build a boat. All right, God, but it better be a small one. I don't want to waste a lot of time with this. God tells Noah, I need you to build it 510 feet long and 50 feet high. How big? 510 feet long and 50 feet high. By myself? No, Noah. Your whole family can help. (laughs) Oh, okay. That's much better. Well, if all of us work on it, I guess, guess I can start. I'll get started on it tomorrow. God says to Noah, now Noah. But God, don't, don't I need to Google first how to build a boat? Noah, I will tell you how to build the boat. Okay, God, how long is it going to take? Well, between 55 and 75 years, depending on your lunch breaks. Boy, God, I'll be old by that time. Yes, Noah, but at least you'll still be alive. This is going to chew up a lot of my free time. Can you get someone else to build the boat? Noah. Oh, okay, God, you win. God says, well, actually, Noah, you win. You see, if Noah was not willing to listen to God, there would have been ample opportunity for him in those 70 years of building the boat for him not to accomplish the task. The reason why Noah was the only one on the earth who could build the boat because he was the only one who was obedient to God. Because nobody else was obeying God, so nobody else could build the boat. We have to realize that in our own life, you may have these great visions or great aspirations. You're going to do something amazing for God. You're going to do something that's just going to change the world. The only way that is going to happen is if you learn how to obey God. If you use your own giftings, your own talents, your own abilities, your own intellect, your own knowledge, your own connections, your own finances, none of that stuff will suffice. The only way is if you learn how to be obedient to God. Deuteronomy 4, 5-6 to says this, See, I have taught your statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me. And you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep them and do them. For that is your wisdom and your understanding. In the sight of people who will hear all these statutes and surely say, this great nation is wise and understanding people. How many people want to be wise? I think wisdom is still a good thing in our culture. I don't think they've Oh, maybe that's not true. I guess they have gone after wisdom. Um, but wisdom comes through obedience to God. 
It's by obeying Him that you get wise. Number three, when you are obedient, you open yourself up to blessings. Okay? If you are disobedient to God, you actually prevent blessings from coming on you. You want a practical application? How many of you reward your kids when they do something bad? Every one of us as parents would know that's not a good idea, right? Like if little Johnny goes in and cuts off all of little Susie's hair, you don't give him a chocolate bar as a reward. Right? Am I the only one who thinks this? Yeah. You don't reward bad actions. You don't reward things that are wrong. God works in the same capacity because He taught us how to work to begin with. God cannot bless you and reward you when you are in disobedience because all that does is encourage more disobedience. Right? So God will bless you in obedience. When you are obedient, you open the door for His blessings. Joshua 1.8 1, says this, And the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you will be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. How do you prosper and get success? By meditating on the word of the Lord. Spending time in the word of God. That's how you do it. Isaiah 1.9 says, If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. Then Jesus says in John 14.21, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. You want to know more about God? It begins with obedience. By obeying God, things are revealed. I, I, I just love that. I will disclose myself to Him. Those who keep His commandments. This next one, number four, is a fun one. When you are obedient, you are choosing God's best. Think about that for a moment. If we believe God is a good God and God has the best intentions for your heart, don't you think what He's going to tell you to do is the best intentions for your life? Isn't God's plan the best plan for you? But somehow we got this thought in our head that says God's way is boring and dull and if I do this thing over here, life will be more exciting and more fulfilling. How's that working out for you? Many pre-believers hold that life as a Christian is boring. And many believers maintain that thought. But I want to tell you this. If the Christian life that you are leading is boring, you're not doing it right. I'll be honest with you. You are not doing it right if you are bored. John 10.10 10 says this. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Okay? So if you do it the way that you want to do it outside of God, it leads to Stealing, killing, and destroying. But if you do what God is calling you to do, you get the abundant life. What's the abundant life? God's fullness poured out on you. The idea that drinking drugs or promiscuity are the best that life has to offer is very sad. You see, God has a master plan for your life, and that plan will bring you the most fulfillment that you can ever imagine. God's love for us is clear that the sacrifice He arranged through Jesus Christ is to provide for us to have the abundant life He promised. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, 
He drew us unto himself and adopted us into his family. You see, once, and this is, this is something that is really heavy on my heart because there's such a large portion of the church that believes in Jesus' salvation, but they don't accept his gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us, equips us, enables us. Holy Spirit is the one who allows us to do things in life that are really fun. God does, God's not a tyrant. He doesn't force us to do things. He always gives us the option to obey Him to do the right thing. But with the option to obey Him also comes the option to disobey Him and do our own thing. But by obeying Him, we actually have access to the best plan our life could ever have. I have to laugh <laughs> when, when people tell me that the Christian life is so boring. I've, in my time, I've witnessed to countless people, and this is kind of a common thread that comes up. It's like, oh, yeah, being a Christian is so boring. I just got to shake them and say, do you have a clue what you're talking about? Man, I've fought demons, okay? I've seen miracles happen. I've seen bones get healed. I've seen, I, I could list for hours of things that would just blow your mind. Have you, have you ever seen a future event take place before it actually happens? That happens to me all the time. Do you actually know stuff in your head that you've never learned? That's most of my life. I'm not a good learner. I'm just a good knower because I listen. Look at the disciples. The early followers of Jesus Christ. They cast out demons, healed the sick, raised the dead, walked on water. Any of you think that's boring? And that is actually what God is equipping and enabling us to do. Yeah, if, if Christianity for you is nothing more than attending church on a Sunday and singing a few songs and then listening to some guy babble on for an hour, yeah, that's boring. But if you learn how to get out and allow the Holy Spirit to operate in and through you, life gets exciting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the stories I could tell. Literally. Uh, I don't have time for that. Ask me about that later. Number five. When you are obedient, you're trusting God to be God. When you are obedient, you're trusting God to be God. This may sound simple, but if you learn how to apply this to your life, it changes everything. If you're a person who worries about everything, you're not trusting in God. If you're a person that's fearful about tomorrow, you're not trusting God. If you're somebody... who believes a weapon of the enemy is greater than the grace of God, you're not trusting God. Obeying God means moving aside and allowing God, His Word, His Holy Spirit, His way of operating to move in our lives. You know, when the, this COVID season happened, Right near the beginning, I, I, there's a, a, this Christian person I know who's quite influential. He, he put out this post. And it started listing all the fears that we should have over this. Like, oh, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. My response to him was simply this. Where is God in your equation? Where does God fit in to your thinking? 
If you allow the things of the world to occupy your thoughts, where does God fit in? When is it that we actually allow God to be God? When do we step out of the way and let Him do what He wants to do the way He wants to do it? You see, that's what obedience is all about. It means trusting or having faith that God will be true to His Word. It's believing that when God says something, He means it. And we can hold Him to that because He's a God who is faithful over and over and over again. But far too often, we're the ones actually getting in the way of Him accomplishing His will rather than allowing Him to accomplish His will through us. When we obey, we don't try to control every aspect of our lives or the situations around us by our own human strength. Instead, we focus on the Lord and keep Him and His Word before our eyes and allowing Him to have His way and trusting that He will fulfill His promises. God's promises are yes and amen. When God promises that He will protect you, that He will keep you from all forms of evil, that he will, His grace rides upon you. These things are true and will happen. But there's a qualifier in it. For those things in your life to take place, what He has promised, you have to be obedient to His will and His Word. If you're, you reject His Word, you reject His plan. If you reject His Word, you reject His purpose. So by allowing obedience to follow, and to be an active part of your life, you're allowing God's will to be done in your life. So if you've ever read the Bible and you've come across something that you, you know in your head to be true, but in your heart, it's not really there, the way to get it from your head into your heart is through obedience. To obey. Not necessarily to understand. You know, we, we got this big part of us. It's like, God, if I don't understand it, it's not from you. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. I'll tell you, most things that God does in my life, I don't understand them until later. Most things that God does in miraculous ways I'm not sitting before and say, yeah, that makes sense to me. I'm usually bewildered, right? Like, I'm like, what? It's not until after the fact that I actually get understanding. The problem for us is a lot of us look for understanding before we start. And God never called us to understand. He called us to obey. When we obey, understanding does come. But it all starts with obedience. So to conclude... You guys didn't think I could do it in 30 minutes, 35 minutes. This is like my shortest sermon ever. Wow. God wants you to obey. Not out of a sense of simple control. Okay? He's not wanting you to obey so that He can control you. It's not about control. It's about love. Okay? When you tell your child not to reach up to the burner on the stove, is that control or is that love? Because you see dangers that your kid doesn't see and you're lovingly trying to protect them from those dangers. That's not control. That's love. So when we obey God, it's not about Him controlling us. It's about Him loving us. It's about Him seeing things that are right for us to do and things that are wrong for us to do. And if we do the things that are wrong for us, it will hurt us. You know the reason why sin is sin? Because You know the reason why God hates sin? Have you ever thought about this? Why God hates sin? It's because sin destroys His creation. Us. The reason why he hates sin is because it destroys us. And it hurts his kids. The, 
the way that we will learn to walk in the fullness that God has, the way we will bestow the... Choose my words wisely here. The way that we will receive the fullness that He has for our life is by us learning how to be obedient. And you never be obedient in the big things until you learn to be obedient in the little things. Okay? God's not going to give you some massive command that you have to fulfill, otherwise He's going to reject you and leave you. Instead, He's going to give you the, the little small nudges. You know what? Call this person. Go visit your neighbor. Send someone an encouraging word. These are things that the Holy Spirit will test us with. Little promptings that don't take a lot of effort, don't take a lot of thought, but they're just simply, will you obey me? You see, when we look at Noah, Noah proved prior to building the boat that he would be obedient to God. Because Noah was obedient in the little things. He stayed righteous before God. He did the righteous acts. So God knew that his obedience that he proved in these things over here could prove that he would be obedient in the big thing over here. And some of you in this place, God is going to ask you in the future to build a boat. Not literally. This is figure it'll be, okay? He's not going to flood the world again. He already told us he won't do that, okay? But he is going to have you do something that is so massive so strange, so out of the ordinary that people look at you and say, that's crazy, why are you doing that? That doesn't make any sense. Noah built a boat in the middle of a desert before there had ever been rain before. You don't think some people got some strange ideas about what he was doing? Don't you think that maybe that Noah's a little wacko? He's building a boat in the middle of dry ground. Hmm, yeah. <sighs> Short of a few birds in that one, yeah. There are people in this place that God is going to ask you to do something that the world thinks is crazy. And in order for you to get to that place where you say, yes, God, I will do it, you've got to be, learn how to be obedient in the little things. The little promptings, the little thoughts, the little suggestions. And also use this trick. It's not a trick, it's actually a life skill. That when you don't do those things, learn how to repent. And then do it the next time. Because what you will quickly find is the more you obey God, the closer your relationship to Him becomes, the greater things He will call you to do. But the fundamental key through all of this is obedience. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for the truth of your word. Thank you, God, for your forgiveness. God, thank you that we have the opportunity to obey you, that you've revealed your heart to us, you've revealed your word, you've given us the written word, but we also have the spoken word that you speak into our lives every single day. God, show us how to be obedient. Show us, God, those times where you're equipping us, enabling us in obedience to prepare us for bigger and greater things. Father, we repent of any time that we have been disobedient. If there are specific instances in our hearts, Lord God, that are restricting your movement, Bring those to our minds right now, Lord. If there are areas where we've been disobedient, where we haven't done what you've called us to do or we've done something we shouldn't have done, and these things are obstacles for us to advance to the fullness of your promises. Over this next week and in this moment right now, Lord, and as we spend time in prayer with you, bring these things to mind. Bring these events, bring these actions, bring these things to the fullness so that we can repent of them and walk in all the fullness you have for us. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless.